Chapter 11, Communism, Catholicism, and World Destiny. Communism, what a scourge it has been, responsible for the deliberate killing of more than 120 million persons, to say nothing of the torturing and imprisoning of untold millions of others. Militantly atheistic, it has been especially antagonistic toward Christianity, which communists understand is their principal enemy and the belief system they hope to replace worldwide. That ambition seemed to be going according to plan as the followers of Marx and Lenin took over country after country in the years following President Roosevelt's gift of Eastern Europe to Stalin. Small wonder that since its inception, Christians have regarded communism as their great enemy. Entire ministries were devoted to opposing communism. Newsletters analyzed what Marx, Lenin, Gus Hall, and Mao Zedong had written to show that their dastardly plan was to destroy Christianity, and so it was. Other ministries were devoted to smuggling Bibles and financial aid behind the iron and bamboo curtains. Those tactics are no longer necessary in Eastern Europe. Though Gorbachev's motives for posing as the champion of religious liberty are no less pragmatic than were Constantine's, one can bring in Bibles and preach the gospel on the streets, activities unthinkable just a few months ago. The same may eventually be true even in China, Cuba, everywhere. Unfortunately, truth is no more the issue now than it ever was. Gorbachev knows that the Soviet people must have something to believe in beyond themselves and their dismal circumstances. Such a quote-unquote faith is essential to carry them through the extremely difficult transition from Marxism to some form of democracy and market economy in the crucial transition period that lies ahead for the entire world. The already overly extended West will have to share its wealth, not only with the failed economies of communism, but with the other underdeveloped countries as well. And the Western powers dare not be ungenerous lest perestroika fail. The communist revolution began in Russia and spread from there around the world. For more than 70 years, the Soviet Union has been the support base of this contagious plague, a support base which has now collapsed. Having openly admitted that communism doesn't work, the Soviets are abandoning it and passing laws for private ownership of property, studying business methods in order to establish free enterprise and seeking to join the capitalist West. It seems reasonable to expect that just as communism spread from Russia around the world, so will its rejection spread as well. Is Christianity, then, being miraculously delivered by God from its nemesis in order to usher in a great worldwide revival? Certainly there is much cause for thanksgiving, and the church must take advantage of the new liberties to spread the gospel as quickly and effectively as possible. At the same time, however, we must be certain that it is the genuine gospel and not a false one that is being proclaimed. Unfortunately, once closed borders have been opened to error as well as to truth. Although the church in Eastern Europe is benefiting from the new freedom, it is at the same time being corrupted by heresies coming in from the West. Soviet national television is now showing its first Christian video, airing just before the evening news. It is a children's cartoon called Superbook, produced by the Christian Broadcasting Network. Unfortunately, a viewer could see no difference between the occult power used by the heroes and other programs and the power emanating from this miraculous book. The Soviets are being misled by a false presentation of Christianity. The first televangelist to be allowed on national Soviet TV explained that he was chosen not only because of the influence of wealthy friends like Armand Hammer, but because, quote, his non-sectarian approach is what appealed to Soviet officials. His message will not be evangelistic despite his strong religious convictions, unquote. He said he would present his longtime message of possibility thinking, a self-esteem message not heavily laden with Jesus talk. Is humanistic gospel masquerading as Christianity, which draws America's largest Sunday morning TV audience, will now seduce the Soviets too, another step along the road to Antichrist's new world religion. Again, we find the pervasive influence of Catholicism, which this preacher considers to be perfectly compatible with his Protestant beliefs. 
Before building his multi-million dollar cathedral, he went to Rome with an artist's sketch of the building to obtain the blessing of the Holy Father. Martin Luther would weep. So should we, and pray, as we see the pieces of the puzzle fitting together. This man's influence is enormous. On the occasion of his 1,000th television broadcast, those who appeared in taped interviews congratulating him included President Bush and the four living ex-presidents of the United States. The Roman Catholic and Russian Orthodox churches, which the Pope hopes to merge, will be by far the major quote-unquote Christian presence and power in Eastern Europe to step into the spiritual vacuum left by communism's failure. The fact that Catholicism is taking over from communism is hardly cause for rejoicing. It is a strategic and necessary move. The Roman Empire cannot be revived without Catholicism recovering its dominant role. That recovery is now taking place with the support of Protestant and political leaders. Though it has suppressed, imprisoned, tortured, and killed millions of Christians, communism has actually not been the worst enemy of true Christianity. That distinction belongs to the Whore of Babylon, which claims to be Christian, yet has sent far more souls to hell than Marxism, with which it has much in common. Ironically, the Roman Catholic Church is as totalitarian as communism ever was. It would be laughable, were the results not so tragic, to see Gorbachev meeting with the Pope and pledging to this spiritual despot that the Soviet Union is going to respect freedom of religion for all of its citizens. There is something sinister about such a spectacle, especially of the Pope going along with a game and posing before the world as the champion of freedom of conscience. This is deceit of the highest order. Such freedom is explicitly denied by the Roman Catholic Church to its members who must accept its teachings without question or be lost forever. It was only after the Russian Revolution that Christians began to view communism as the Antichrist system. Yet for 400 years before 1917, Catholicism was so identified by Protestants. All of the reformers, from Luther and Calvin to Knox and the rest of their contemporaries, were convinced that the Roman Catholic Church was representative of the great apostasy prophesied in Scripture. Such was the view of most Protestant leaders from Wesley and Whitfield to Spurgeon and D. Martin Lloyd-Jones. We might well ask what persuaded Protestants to change this long-established and deep conviction, for indeed it has changed. Although Roman Catholicism remains the same, many of today's leading evangelicals suggest that Protestants can cooperate with Rome in evangelizing the world. In actual fact, the Roman Catholic Church is the most powerful and effective enemy of Christianity in history. Its teachings are masterpieces of deception. In reading not what ex-members or anti-Catholics write, but the official publications of the Roman Catholic Church itself, one soon discovers that it is the largest and most dangerous religious cult that ever existed. Yet today's cult experts rarely, if ever, include the Roman Catholic Church on their lists because it is now unacceptably negative to criticize Catholicism. That attitude represents a complete repudiation of the Reformation and the multitudes of martyrs who gave their lives to break the total control which Rome wields over men's minds and souls. Partnership with Rome sets the stage for the rise of Antichrist. One writer points out, quote, The 1973 edition of OMF leader J. Oswald Sanders' book, Cults and Isms, placed Catholicism at the head of the list of heresies, but the Roman Catholic chapter was dropped in his 1981 edition. Josh McDowell and Don Stewart, in their book Understanding the Cults, lists 11 characteristics of cults. Roman Catholicism has every one of the characteristics, yet is not listed. Why? Unquote. Jehovah's Witnesses, Sun Myung Moon's Unification Church, and other cults all share cultic features that have long been elements of Catholicism. The first point that Mormon missionaries make sounds familiar, with only a few names and dates changed. That theirs is the one true church, outside of which there is no salvation, and that its current head is the true representative of Christ on earth through apostolic succession back to Joseph Smith, God's true prophet. Catholics claim the same for their church and pope. Cultic doctrines often include much that sounds biblical. 
Mormons, for example, affirm that Christ died for our sins and rose the third day. His sacrifice, however, was not enough. It is good deeds, obedience to the Mormon hierarchy, and participation in the temple rituals that must earn the eternal life that Christ actually offers as a free gift. So it is in Roman Catholicism. The Church is the dispenser of salvation through the rituals performed by its priesthood, without which mankind would be lost in spite of all Christ has done. Like Mormonism and other cults, Catholicism denies to the individual assurance of salvation through a personal relationship with Christ. In place of the one who said, Come unto me, Rome says, Come unto me, and insists that salvation is not by grace through faith, but must be earned through church membership and obedience to her many rules and regulations. Another primary mark of a cult is a perceived infallibility of the leadership, resulting in unquestioning submission to dogmatic authoritarianism. The head of the cult is never wrong. He sets the rules of life, defines terms, and literally thinks for his followers. No cult exercises such thought control more thoroughly or efficiently than the Roman Catholic Church through the alleged infallibility of its pope and priestly hierarchy. While there has been superficial encouragement to read the Bible since the Second Vatican Council, held 1962 through 1965, and known as Vatican II, Catholics cannot let Scripture speak for itself, but must see it only as the Church interprets it. In June 1990, the Vatican's watchdog of orthodoxy, German Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, with papal approval, released in eight languages a 7,500-word instruction for theologians and bishops. As the Los Angeles Times reported, quote, Asserting central authority, the Vatican on Tuesday bluntly told Roman Catholic theologians, and by extension questioning Catholics, that it will not tolerate public dissent from official church teachings. Freedom of the act of faith cannot justify a right to dissent, the document asserts. Neither can dissent be justified as a matter of following one's conscience. To succumb to the temptation of dissent is to allow the leaven of infidelity to the Holy Spirit to start to work. It insists, unquote. Catechisms distinctly declare that man can obtain a knowledge of God's word only from the Catholic Church and through its duly constituted channels. Catholics must accept whatever the divine church, outside of which there is no salvation, teaches on faith, morals, and the means of grace. Catholic apologist Carl Keating writes unapologetically, quote, The Catholic believes in inspiration of the Bible because the church tells him so that is putting it bluntly, and that same church has the sole authority to interpret the inspired text, unquote. That church's teachings must be obeyed unquestioningly by all members, or they are eternally damned. The huge church council, Vatican II, made changes that should have revealed to Catholics that Rome was not infallible as she claimed. Catholics were suddenly allowed to eat meat on Friday, though previously those who did so went to hell if they failed to confess to a priest. Certain quote-unquote saints, such as St. Christopher, were demoted, and the requirement that the Mass must be recited in Latin was dropped. But this was really just so much window dressing. The heretical doctrines of salvation that provoked the Reformation were not changed, and the cultic grip of the Church was actually tightened, as the following excerpts from Vatican II indicate. Quote, but the task of giving an authentic interpretation of the Word of God, whether in its written form or in the form of tradition, which is equal to the Bible, has been entrusted to the living teaching office of the Church alone. But by divine institution, it is the exclusive task of these pastors alone, the successors of Peter and the other apostles, to teach the faithful authentically, that is, with the authority of Christ. We believe in the infallibility enjoyed by the successor of Peter, that is the Pope, when he speaks ex cathedra as shepherd and teacher of all the faithful, an infallibility which the whole episcopate, that is, the bishops, cardinals, and so forth, enjoys when it exercises with him the supreme magisterium. Unquote. The Council of Trent met during 1545 to 1563 to discuss the demands of the reformers, that the Bible rather than the church should be the final authority, that salvation is by grace through faith alone instead of through good deeds, suffering for one's sins, and the sacraments ministered by the church, 
that prayers should not be made to the saints, nor should their images be venerated, that instead of the elite class of supposedly celibate clergy, the Bible taught the priesthood of all believers, and so forth. The outcome was inevitable. Every heretical dogma was reaffirmed, and every belief upon which Protestantism was founded, and for which countless martyrs gave their lives, was rejected by the Council of Trent. Its canons and decrees, as Vatican II once again reaffirmed, are considered to be a summation of Roman Catholicism, valid for all time. Today's catechisms, more than 400 years later, continue to require all Roman Catholics to pledge absolute and unquestioning obedience to the dogmas reaffirmed at Trent. A standard oath begins, quote, I accept without hesitation and profess all that has been handed down, defined and declared by the sacred canons and by the general councils, especially by the sacred council of Trent and by the Vatican general council, Vatican II, and in a special manner concerning the primacy and infallibility of the Roman pontiff. Unquote. It is extremely difficult for Roman Catholics to escape the cultic grip in which they are held because they have been convinced that their church controls the gates of heaven. To disobey her is to be eternally damned. Thus, even though many Catholics become disillusioned and no longer attend Mass or go to confession, at death they still want a Catholic funeral, just in case, and hope that their relatives will continue to have Masses performed to get them out of purgatory. The cultic oath which they have sworn continues to hold them in its grip. Quote, I recognize the Holy Roman, Catholic, and Apostolic Church as the mother and teacher of all, and I promise and swear true obedience to the Roman Pontiff, successor of St. Peter, Prince of the Apostles, and Vicar of Christ. This same Catholic faith, outside of which nobody can be saved, which I now freely profess and to which I truly adhere, the same I promise and swear to maintain and profess until the last breath of life." Unquote. It is not difficult to see how this absolute, unthinking submission to their church hierarchy prepares Catholics for the total submission that will be required by the Antichrist. If the Pope identifies this impostor as the Christ, the obedience of Catholics is assured. Submission to the Pope is far broader than most people realize. It is generally believed that the Pope is infallible only when he speaks ex cathedra, but that is not the case. The following pronouncement of Vatican II is unequivocal. Quote, this loyal submission of the will and intellect must be given, in a special way, to the authentic teaching authority of the Roman Pontiff, even when he does not speak ex cathedra, in such wise, indeed, that his supreme teaching authority be acknowledged with respect, and that one sincerely adhere to the decisions made by him, conformably with his manifest mind and intention." Unquote. The Roman Catholic Church, as the sole interpreter of Scripture, seduces its members into embracing a different God, a different Jesus Christ, and a different plan of salvation from that taught in the Bible. Confusion arises because Rome uses biblical terms such as justification by grace, the virgin birth, the blood atonement of the cross, and the resurrection of Jesus. Yet what Rome means by such language is entirely different from what evangelicals believe and the Bible teaches. It takes but a few minutes of reading its own publications, readily available to any interested party, to realize that Roman Catholicism has completely corrupted and firmly opposes the gospel which evangelicals preach. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones explained the cause of confusion among so many Protestants. Quote, in one sense, you might well think that the Roman Catholic Church is the most orthodox church in the world. It believes that Jesus of Nazareth was the eternal Son of God. It believes in the virgin birth. It believes in the incarnation. It believes in his miracles. It believes in his substitutionary work upon the cross and his resurrection, and so forth. But at this point the subtlety comes in and the difficulty arises. To all that orthodox truth, she adds, with a damnable plus, things which are utterly unscriptural and which, indeed, become a denial of the scripture. So she lands us eventually in a position in which, if we accept her teaching, we are believing a lie." Unquote. For example, to its confession that Christ died for our sins, Romanism adds dogmas whose effect is to deny that his death was sufficient. One's own good deeds, obedience to the church, and participation in its sacraments must be added to what Christ has done. 
the rosary, the confession to a priest, baptism into the church, and indulgences earned are also required. And in addition to Christ's suffering on the cross, the individual must also suffer for his own sins in purgatory, where the soul, though cleansed by the blood of Christ, must be more thoroughly purged. Then there is the endless list of alms, good deeds, and masses that others must engage in after one is dead in order to obtain his or her release from purgatory and entrance into heaven at last. In contrast, the Apostle Peter declared that the resurrection of Christ had secured for believers an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, that is, to heaven. 1 Peter 1, verses 4 and 5, and chapter 3, verse 18. Paul assured the believers that to die was to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord, that is, in heaven, not in purgatory. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8. As for deviating from this truth, Paul was very explicit. There be some that would pervert the gospel of Christ, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Galatians 1, verses 7 through 9. The Roman Catholic Church, from the Pope down, preaches a far different gospel from that which the apostles preached. For leading untold millions astray with a false gospel, they qualify for the curse that Paul solemnly pronounced. Yet Rome boldly pronounces its own eternal curse upon those who dare to preach Paul's gospel, that the death of Christ upon the cross paid the full debt for our sins, and that salvation is not by works, but a free gift of God's grace to all who believe. The Council of Trent declared, and Vatican II has confirmed, quote, If anyone says that after the reception of the grace of justification, the guilt is so remitted and the debt of eternal punishment so blotted out to every repentant sinner, that no debt of temporal punishment remains to be discharged, that is, by the person's own suffering, either in this world or in purgatory, before the gates of heaven can be opened, let him be anathema, that is, eternally damned. We affirm that there is a purgatory, and that the souls there detained are aided by the suffrages of the faithful, and that the bishop shall see to it that the suffrages of the living, that is, the sacrifice of the mass, prayers, alms, and other works of piety, which they have been accustomed to perform to the faithful departed, be piously and devoutly discharged in accordance with the laws of the church." Unquote. The rejection of the biblical gospel could not be more clearly stated. In its place, a lie is proclaimed which flagrantly denies Paul's declaration. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. To say that every repentant sinner, for whom Christ suffered the full penalty demanded by God's justice, must nevertheless suffer for his sins, even after receiving the grace of justification, repudiates the cross and is a denial of the entire Bible. How then can Protestants propose to join Catholics in evangelizing the world? D. Martin Lloyd-Jones protested, quote, There are movements afoot which are trying to bring a kind of rapprochement between Roman Catholicism and Protestantism. This Roman Catholic system is altogether more dangerous than is communism itself. Roman Catholicism is the devil's greatest masterpiece, it is such a departure from the Christian faith and the New Testament teaching that her dogma is a counterfeit. She is, as the scripture puts it, the whore. Let me warn you very solemnly that if you rejoice in these ecumenical approaches to Rome, you are denying the blood of the martyrs. There are innocent people who are being deluded by this kind of falsity, and it is your business and mine to open their eyes." Unquote. Concerning the sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice upon the cross, the Bible is abundantly clear. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, for then must he often have suffered for sin, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Hebrews 9, verses 25 and 26. Yet the false gospel preached by the Roman Catholic Church completely contradicts these and many other similar scriptures. Rome insists that, in order to be efficacious, 
Christ's death must be reenacted on Catholic altars around the world in mystery form and in an unbloody manner through endless repetitions of the sacrifice of the Mass. This is made possible through the priest's alleged power to turn bread and wine into the literal body, blood, soul, spirit, and divinity of Jesus Christ. See Appendix C. The horrible deception is made all the more persuasive and destructive by Protestant leaders suggesting that the Roman Catholic Church preaches the biblical gospel. For example, the host and hostess of a popular Christian TV show, who head the world's largest Christian television network, frequently give viewers the false impression that Roman Catholic doctrine is no different from that of evangelicals. On one program, while interviewing three Catholic leaders, the host declared that the difference between Protestant and Catholic doctrines was merely a matter of semantics. As for transubstantiation, a heresy so great that thousands died at the stake rather than accept it, he declared, quote, Well, we Protestants believe the same thing. We were really meaning the same thing, but just saying it a little differently. I am eradicating the word Protestant even out of my vocabulary. I'm not protesting anything. It's time for Catholics and non-Catholics to come together as one in the Spirit and one in the Lord." Unquote. Such misinformation is deadly. It is misleading evangelicals into accepting Catholics as genuine Christians, when in fact they need to hear the biblical gospel and be delivered from the false hope offered by Rome. It is also leading astray many others who are sincerely seeking the truth, but are being given the false impression that there is no difference between the New Testament gospel and the doctrines of Rome. If Martin Luther were living today and opposed the many heresies of Roman Catholicism as he did in the 1500s, he would be accused of causing division, not only by the Catholics as he was then, but by his fellow Protestants as well. Protestant leaders who are encouraging cooperation with Rome are opposing the very Reformation that gave them the freedoms they now enjoy, and they are making a mockery of the hundreds of thousands of martyrs who gave themselves to the flames rather than make the compromise which these Christian leaders now promote. Crying out against the already growing trend among Protestants in his day to accept Catholicism, C. H. Spurgeon passionately declared, quote, I dread much the spirit which would tamper with truth for the sake of united action, or for any other object under heaven. Not so, thought our fathers, when, at the stake, they gave themselves to death for truths which men nowadays count unimportant, but which, being truths, were to them so vital that they would sooner die than suffer them to be dishonored. Oh, for the same uncompromising love of truth— I pray God evermore to preserve us from unity in which the truth shall be considered valueless, in which principle gives place to policy. May there ever be found some men who shall denounce again and again all league with error and all compromise with sin, and declare that these are the abhorrence of God. The destruction of every sort of union which is not based on truth is a preliminary to the unity of the Spirit." Unquote. Were Spurgeon alive today, he would be shocked to see that the situation, bad as it was in his time, has deteriorated rapidly in the past few years. It is now common for Christian leaders to justify their adulterous partnership with Catholics in world evangelism by saying, I will not separate myself from anyone who names the name of Christ. Of course, Mormons name the name of Christ, as do Jehovah's Witnesses, Christian Scientists, and other cultists, occultists, and New Agers and their Christ is a blasphemous counterfeit. So is the Christ of Roman Catholicism. That even evangelicals who should be stemming the tide of delusion are becoming parties to preparing the world for the false Christ who will head the revived Roman Empire is the great tragedy of our day. And the demise of communism in Eastern Europe has created a euphoria that encourages further carelessness with regard to sound doctrine and opens the door to a false gospel. Whatever the future of communism, the world is not destined to come under the dominion of a Marxist dictator, but of Antichrist. Atheism will not triumph, but a false religion. And the Roman Catholic Church will play a key role in bringing this about, and thus in determining mankind's destiny. Yet we need not helplessly wring our hands at the tragedy. There is great joy in standing true to God's word, and great opportunity to rescue many from eternal doom.